Thank you very much. If we can just resume our seats. I believe we have our participants online ready and waiting for this uh, uh, final session this afternoon here in the Italian room, building consensus and coordination on the current global crisis response initiatives. Uh, so the potential role of donors and the global donor platform for rural uh, development. Just think about the background. We've talked a lot about the ongoing crises, the things that are affecting the global food systems. We talked about the pandemic. We've looked at the potential for what happened in 2008 to occur again in 2022. We've got um, the awful events going on in Ukraine and the implications for food systems. We've got mobilization uh, of an, a range of initiatives, including the G7 Global Alliance for Food Security, GAFS, the UN Global Crisis Response a Group, the Food and Agriculture Resilience Mission of Farm and the International Finance Institution Action Plan to address food insecurity. We've got the Global Food Security Call to Action and the African Emergency Food Production Facility. So these efforts are, are welcome, they're, they're essential, but are they aligned enough? Hmm? Um, and numerous calls to action, well, they can, of course, lead to uh, complexity, investment fragmentation, and the risk of failing to mobilize additional investment in food systems beyond uh, the traditional sources of funding. So we need coherent and coordinating action. In this, in particular, as we have mentioned, in all the other areas and streams we've discussed over the past uh, couple of days. So this special session is called Building Consensus and Coordination on the Current Global Crisis Response Initiatives. We're going to look at a range of questions, including how the current donors' crisis response initiatives include both the necessary emergency measures to prevent immediate hunger and poverty while keeping substantial focus on the medium and long-term goal of resilience in food systems. How can donors ensure the coordination and harmonization required to amplify the objectives and results of their various initiatives. And then the various emergency mechanisms that I've talked about, um, are they working in an aligned fashion? So we have a range of uh, speakers. Some are going to be in here in the room and some will be online. And in no particular order for now, we've got Jim Barnhart, who is Assistant to the Administrator, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Uh, we have Beth Dunford, Vice President for Agriculture, Human and Social Development, African Development Bank. And Beth, I have just met a moment or two ago. We have Gabriel Ferrero de Loma Osario, Chairperson of the Committee on World Food Security at CFS and Ambassador at Large for Global Food Security from Spain. Celine Jorgensen, Ambassador and Permanent Representative for France to the UN, UN agencies in Rome. Sebastian Lesch. Head of Division, Sustainable Agricultural Supply Chains, um, International Agricultural Policy. Uh, we're starting to see faces now. Good, and begin to see faces. That's what I like to see. Uh, working for the, the BMC, Germany. David Nabarro, UN Global Crisis Response Group, Food Workstream, co lead and strategic director of 4SD. And uh, Satu Santala, Associate Vice President, External Relations and Governance Department. International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. Okay, so you're all lined up and ready to go. So who do we have in the room? I think Beth Dunford, Vice President for Agriculture at the FDB is here. Uh, who else do we have in the room of the uh, people that I listed? I think, is it just Beth? It's just Beth. So let, why don't we sit together? Okay. Fantastic, okay. Um, this was an important session uh, to hold really. We couldn't afford not to talk about it because the protagonists of the various crisis response initiatives are here. So let's start off, uh, si vous voulez, with Celine Jorgensen from uh, France, Ambassador Jorgensen. Uh, please, would you elaborate, to start us off, on how far will be funded and its results achieved, and what is the relationship with the other initiatives proposed? And I ask all speakers to bear in mind, we have seven of you, we have a couple of rounds of questions, and I'm going to have to be benevolently dictatorial in the timekeeping. So if you're going over the initial allotted time, I'll have to bring you to a close and move to the next speaker so that we can get through the round of questions. Thank you very much. 
So Ambassador Jorgensen, over to you, please. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, GDPRD for giving us the opportunity to, to discuss on uh, such an important matter. Uh, you mentioned FARM, the Food and Agriculture Resilience Mission. Indeed, President Macron, in the context of the French presidency of the European Union, announced the launch of this international initiative on 24th of March. And this initiative was endorsed by the head of states and government of the European Council. So I would like to stress here that it's not beyond the French dimension, it's a European uh, dimension of farm. Farm's initiative is really to prevent the catastrophic effects for global food security of the war Russia is waging in Ukraine through operational actions under the lead of key international organizations depending on the pillars. Uh, so there is a need of, co of coordination, you mentioned that, uh, and therefore we welcome uh, the G7 German presidency's lead in setting up a political coordination through the Global Alliance on Food Security, the call to action led by the US, Italy's outreach ministerial event for Mediterranean countries, and IFI's response to the crisis. The GAFS offers the necessary political and financial mobilization to respond to the crisis, and it needs to be mobilized beyond the G7. We see FARM as an operational roadmap for the Global Alliance through the implementation of substantial proposals made by international organizations mobilized. So coming to the substance quickly, the FARM initiative is a comprehensive set of actions which encompasses three pillars. First, a trade pillar to ease tensions on the agricultural markets, guarantee full transparency on flows and stocks, and combat unjustified trade barriers. The strengthening of AMIS, the agriculture market information system, is of a key element in this respect, and France has already decided to increase it's funding to AMIS and calls other like, like-minded countries to do the same. Second, a solidarity pillar, first to support, of, of course, Ukraine's agriculture capabilities, but also through an ad hoc mechanism developed by WFP to ensure access to agriculture commodities at reasonable price in the countries most affected by the impact of the war, thanks to the combination of contributions by donor countries, including France, of course, but also a strong private sector contribution. Third pillar, this is a production pillar, to strengthen agricultural capabilities sustainably in the countries most affected and to contribute to building more sustainable and resilient food system after the Food System Summit. Our discussion in GDPRD is, will mostly revolve over, around this pillar, I guess, but it's crucial to have this multi-level action and understanding also to address the short term through trade and solidarity measures. IFAD is leading the work of this third pillar and is about to circulate a detailed document including priority actions and financial options. To sum up, the ambition of uh, this pillar is really to strengthen what already exists from a European perspective, for example, we can mention programs such as the Great Green Wall Initiative, the Plant Proteins Initiatives launched at the European African Union Summit, etc. This pillar should also be in harmony with regional framework policies such as the African Union Comprehensive African uh, Agricultural Development Program, of course, and countries' national plans. So multilateral and bilateral donors such as uh, the African Development Bank and the World Bank, of course, are invited to contribute to this pillar. Thank you very much. Back to you. Ambassador, thank you very much for uh, setting us off with uh, such coherence and with, with such energy. I, I like that. It's, it's excellent. And talking of energy, uh, David Nabarro, who I've met a couple of times. David, in, in different guises, it's, it's, it's great to see you here in this guise now for SD. Can you talk to us a bit about the function and objectives of, of the crisis group and what was it going to deliver concretely? Because I'm, I'm bearing in mind the announcement of the Secretary General, UN Secretary General Guterres, uh, talking about the creation of two task forces to allow for, and I quote, a safe and secure export of Ukrainian produced food through the Black Sea. 
as well as to ensure unimpeded access to global markets for Russian food and fertilizer. So uh, can you explain, please, how these two important objectives are being sought? Over to you. Thanks a lot, Henry. Good to see everybody. It's an honor to be here and to talk about the global crisis response group set up by the UN Secretary General on the uh, 14th of March, 2022. Uh, but this is a, a, an effort to try to reduce the degree of suffering and distress among the poor people in our world who are already in difficulty because of the impacts of multiple shocks, including COVID-19, accelerating climate change, increasing conflicts, uh, and the rising in costs that was being reported really as early as September last year by participants in the uh, Food Systems Summit. But things have got a lot worse in food, energy, and finance systems really since the middle of February. And so this uh, particular mechanism set up by the UN Secretary General is focusing on how the disturbances in these different systems are feeding through to the poor people in our world. Essentially, the baseline is that a 10% increase in the cost of food for poor people could lead to around a 5% drop in their purchasing power. So with food costs increasing by 20 or 30% in inelastic incomes of poor people, essentially what we're seeing is not just a food crisis, not just an energy crisis, but a real cost of living crisis uh, that is leading to uh, basically large numbers of people below the poverty line going into extreme distress. And close to the poverty line, they're becoming very poor. This is particularly affecting poor people wherever they are, and particularly women and children, but it's also affecting smallholder farmers because fertilizer and other agricultural inputs have been badly impacted by these rising costs. Uh, we suspect that as many as 20% of smallholders could find the next, not just few months, but few years extremely difficult. Uh, and uh, what is currently a crisis in access to food could easily turn in to a crisis in availability. And already small and medium enterprises in rural areas, in so many places are going out of business. Out of business. 94 countries are uh, exposed to this. 1.7 billion people are at risk of a greater impoverishment as a result of this cost of living crisis. 1.2 billion people seriously at risk. Uh, these countries are right across the world, 38 in Sub-Saharan Africa, eight in Middle East and North Africa, uh, 12 in Europe, uh, and Central Asia, six in South Asia, 11 in East Asia, and a number also in the Pacific. It really is a serious and worsening crisis. It requires action by all. There are five things that the Global Crisis Response Group is focused on. Getting everybody involved and coordinated. And secondly, uh, really making certain that the fact that it's a a problem of access now and availability later. So focusing on productivity and resilience and stopping export bans where possible so as to keep markets open with a particular focus on fertilizer from Ukraine and uh, fertilizer, sorry, from Russia and food from Ukraine, two task forces, a lot of work underway, but it's private diplomacy right now, Henry, and I'm not at liberty to go into it. But perhaps the third thing to say is it's a cost of living crisis with nearly, uh, well, with over a billion people at risk. That means protecting social protection on a very wide scale. And there's also an increase in humanitarian need because of the climate impacts, particularly the drought in East Africa uh, with the global uh, uh, network against um, food crisis showing us that at least 30 million are going into ICP3+. plus. And so we're saying in addition to the social protection, we need humanitarian assistance everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, this does mean more finance is needed urgently. Countries are in extremely tight 
fiscal situation and with the UN uh, trying to coordinate its work, we hope that we will be able to encourage others to coordinate their work. Uh, this is going to go on at least till the end of 22 and into 2023. So let's stick together. Look forward to further discussion. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Well, I must say, I mean, I'm sure we all feel this. You, you painted a pretty apoc apocalyptic um, picture. Uh, but at the same time, thankfully, mobilization is taking place. You know, both pre-existing mechanisms and new ones are being triggered to respond to these multiple shocks at this point in time. The question is, are they aligned? Are they working in a complementary fashion or are they, are they conflicting in, in some areas? Some are working directly, some are working in concert with others. So let's talk to uh, Sebastian Lesch from the BMZ, uh, the German, German Federal uh, Development uh, Organization and Ministry, and uh, GAFS, the Global Alliance for Food Security, G7. Of course, it's centered around the concept of coordination. So can you talk to us about how GAFS envisages making sure this coordination really does take place? What kind of practical support will it deliver? Will there be additional financial support available to support inclusive, sustainable food system transformation? Over to you, Sebastian Lesch. Thank you, Henry. It is indeed a pleasure to be with everyone. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, and uh, indeed, David did point uh, a terrible picture here. And so I'm not going to repeat this, but just let it sink in. I think it's very important that we are aware of that, uh, that uh, terrible dark picture that is there. Um, the Global Alliance for Food Security is a political coalition meant for like-minded countries, organizations to address the food security crisis. Um, it's not a new institution. It is not a mechanism. It's a joint forum that is meant to support and leverage existing structures, uh, mechanisms and initiatives. And I think that is quite important uh, because Henry, as we were rightly asking, um, uh, are those initiatives aligned? We have them here all around the table, which I think is very good. And my very clear answer here would be, yes, they are complementary. And that is our goal, to have them complementary. And uh, as Germany, we do appreciate all the initiatives that are there, from farm to the Mediterranean outreach to everything the international financial institutions are bringing to the table to, of course, the US outreach that even led to the Security Council. So that is very much appreciated. The objective of the Global Alliance is to catalyze a response that is agile, that is immediate, and that is coordinated to this uh, unfolding crisis that shows solidarity and supports those most affected. Why has Germany started that? Why is, is it me speaking to you of that? That's, of course, coming out of the G7 presidency. Uh, when we um, uh, saw this, this war coming, uh, we uh, had the G7 presidency hat on in Berlin, and we felt that people were looking to Berlin for that crisis and that, for that crisis leadership um, and for that initiative. And that is how GAFS was conceived uh, and, and came along, and it is, it is growing. The idea is to temporarily join forces, identify, map, and publicize the knowledge and resources that we have, use them in an optimized manner, and thus ensure a coherent and effective response. We see ourselves explicitly in support of the United Nations Global Crisis Response Group that we have brought on board uh, from the beginning. Um, and we see ourselves not as duplicating anything that is going on, but as really as a convener, as bringing those different things together to one table, make sure that we're doing the right thing, that we're doing it in the right way, that we're not leaving anything out or anyone behind. This is the, the, the basic uh, proposition. The value added, I think, is twofold. The value proposition is agility. Agility is a word that can mean many things. What we mean by it is it is a quick response, but it also has a learning loop built in. There are three pillars that are called action, advice, and advance, the three A's, and we want them to be mutually informative. We want to know what will be going on in three months' time, in six months' time, from the science side. We need to have the political advice built in to judge what's going on politically. What is it we need to do in terms of trade, for example? And we need the action at the center of it all. This is mutually informative. And the second added value, of course, is a common narrative. Here's the international community that is ready to take on responsibility to mitigate that hunger crisis that is going on and that David so heavily pictured. Uh, and that is able to act now, that is capable of action now, and also to show uh, who, how we can be part of the solution. Yeah. So this is uh, the basis uh, behind uh, this uh, global alliance that we are putting forward. It is not a pledging mechanism. Um, 
I think that's very important to note that this is not some, something that anyone is going to pay money into. That's not behind it. Uh, everyone who is going to spend money in Germany is at the forefront of this. You know that our chancellor has already put forward half a billion US dollars and more is probably to follow in the framework of the G7 summit that is coming up. Um, everyone who is going to spend money for this crisis will do so through their own mechanisms and through their own initiatives. Some will do it multilaterally, go through WFP, go through IFAD. Uh, some will uh, go through the World Bank, some will go through GFSP, some will do things bilaterally. That is all very fine and appreciated. GAF is there for coordination. It is not there as a pledging mechanism. And it does not see itself as competition uh, to all those different initiatives that are going on. It's really a platform where we can come together, bring things to the table and see how we can best match the needs of those most affected. Because that is what this whole discussion should be about. Thank you and back to you, Henry. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Sebastian. Uh, thank you for underlining uh, that very, very important uh, point that is complementary. It is not in competition with all the other uh, mechanisms, whether bilateral, multilateral, that are there at the moment, some of which have uh, very deep roots, have been around for a long time, and then get mobilized, and some of which have been reborn, given the extent of the current crises. Let's... Uh, Talk to Jim Barnard, Jim uh, from USAID. Uh, let's see you, fantastic. How are you? Good to see you again. Um, let's think about this. I mean, one of the objectives of the global food security call to action is to strengthen sustainable, resilient, and inclusive food systems in line with the United Nations uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that we all have. We've had it seeped into our marrow over the past uh, few years. So the question is, what are the actions the U.S. and other donors can take to foster such uh, long-term resilience? Everyone talks about resilience and prevent another food crisis because these things are cyclical. Do we get any better at predicting them? And when they come back, having learned from the lessons of the last one, when was the last one? 2007 and 8, uh, 14 years ago. Are we better prepared now for what happens from this point onwards. Hi, Henry. It is great to see you again as well. Um, you're an incredibly dynamic uh, moderator. It, it's fun to be a part of a group, <laughs> both, both this illustrious group that they have you guiding, guiding the discussion. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Look, uh, and, and I think uh, between David has outlined, uh, I think, a really clear sense of the, the challenge that's facing us. Um, the ambassador led off with the, some of the work that, that France is doing and what they're trying to push forward. And I and I can say that you know having worked closely with Sebastian over the last um, few months, particularly rather engaged um, intensely on the the formation of GAFs, the United States is is all in to try to support this kind of global platform, bringing together multiple partners, uh, public, private, civil society within the GAFs in a way that really does harness our, our collective strengths. You know, the U.S. government, you know, with, with our allies and partners is, is committed to, to, to mitigating the, the impacts and allevi alleviating the, both that immediate um, and medium term and long term uh, challenges of hunger and food insecurity that have, that have really been exacerbated in the last few months by Russia's um, unprovoked invasion of, of Ukraine. And you, you asked Henry, you know, how do we plan for this? That that was certainly something that none of us saw just a few months ago. This is this is this is really challenging our ability to be um, as nimble and, and flexible as possible, while at the same time staying focused on our um, fundamental goals of, as you say, promoting resilience at, at the household level, the community level, and at the the national level. Um, you know, last month, President Biden signed into law additional funding that's uh, around the Ukraine crisis um, that, that will, among other investments, provide four point three um, billion dollars in humanitarian assistance. A lot of that being food assistance and other kinds of assistance to help um, families and communities get through these next um, few months and the next few years, really. Um, and then along with that is another seven hundred and sixty million dollars to support medium um, and longer term um, resilience efforts on, on promoting uh, long term food and security um, or <laughs> promoting long term food security um, globally. So we're encouraging other donors to step up and increase their food security and humanitarian assistance um, and uh, along with us as, as partners. 
Um, with these additional resources, um, Henry, we're, we're going to address uh, the, the short, medium, and longer term impacts on food insecurity. So with our, our US government's flagship program initiative, the Feed the Future initiative, um, we're gonna be working in these following areas. We're gonna be looking at mitigating the global uh, fertilizer shortage by, by working with developing countries to reduce their dependence on fertilizer exports from, from Russia. And we're helping smallholder farmers overcome those shortages so they can obtain fertilizer with, and to be as absolutely productive as possible. We're going to increase investments in agriculture capacity and resilience. Um, that, that's both supporting the national, regional, and community responses to higher prices and, and supply disruptions. And we're going to be cushioning macroeconomic shock and an impact on poor people. And I think David made a very compelling case to try to address that particular issue, right? So that's the idea of expanding social protection and safety nets that, that protect livelihoods and, and assets. And it's particularly important for, for women and youth as they often bear the brunt of these kinds of crises. And so we need to have a special attention on, on women and youth. And then we want to, in, to, to sustain our high level global political engagement to make sure that uh, all of us are coming to the table, um, again, public sector, private sector, civil society, um, to coordinate our responses. And the GAFS is an absolutely great um, platform to do so. So these efforts, these new efforts that the, the president announced um, a short while ago, um, are building upon our $5 billion over five-year commitment through our Feed the Future program. Look, the, the challenge is daunting. The needs of the, the global food security crisis far surpass anything that any, any one of us can do. So we do have to continue to think of how we bring us together. It's got to be comprehensive. It has to be coordinated. And it, it does need to involve all partners. So I, I will pause there, Henry, and pass it back to you. Jim, thank you very much indeed for that. And it's good to hear uh, what happens after the big announcement, because in my business, in the news business, uh, we will talk, you know, 5 billion, we'll talk about the huge headline figure. And that's what people will respond to when they read their newspaper or listen on the radio or watch on the TV, but they don't quite know what happens after that and what that money is meant to drive in the various different streams and the various different needs it's meant to address. So thank you for that. And, and talking of which, the African Development Bank and Beth Dunford, Vice President is, is with me, and uh, uh, good to be with you in uh, Accra for your annual uh, meetings uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And just thinking about the Africa Emergency Food uh, Production Plan, which the bank announced, and the idea is, of course, to support policy reforms, facilitate modern inputs, uh, getting to farmers, which you've heard of just a moment or two ago, strengthening national institutions, overseeing input markets, good stuff. The plan also aims to increase food production by 30%, very ambitious, through 2024. So, so what measures and actions will be taken then in this endeavor? And how will this new support and initiative be coordinated with other measures? Because we want coordination and alignment, don't we? Uh, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for the question and really for convening this conversation and bringing all these important players together. And I just wanted to say that first, I mean, to really, to really get at this food crisis, there's going to need to be short-term interventions, uh, medium-term interventions, and longer-term interventions. So, it, you know, meet basic needs of people who are suffering right now, um, emergency assistance. Um, there's going to be a need to sort of continue to build on, you know, really fix um, this the food system that really has a lot of structural issues that have been really laid bare by this dependence upon you know importation of key staple, staples to meet basic needs and that's something that you know there are a lot of issues that need to be fixed around that but what we can do i think in the short term i'm not talking tomorrow but i'm talking in the next few months the next agricultural season is dramatically and quickly ramp up food production the potential to increase food production on the continent in africa is huge and that's something really that we specialize in and have a lot of experience in at the African Development Bank. And you know, how then do we deliver innovative ways to farmers to produce more food staples from more African farmers, to produce more nutritious foods, to really support more Africans in need right now? Um, so we're standing up, as you've heard, this facility, um, the African Emergency Food Production Facility. And again, this really looks to mobilize $1.5 billion to accelerate food production in key staples over the next few agricultural seasons. Uh, reaching 20 million farmers 
uh, with improved climate smart uh, technologies with fertilizers um, to produce 38 million metric tons of food. So again, this is something that we can mobilize very quickly building on existing platforms uh, to increase food production very, very quickly um, in the short term. This is building on, um, as I said, our platform technologies for African agricultural transformation, which has already reached 12 million farmers with certified seeds. Um, you know, we like to talk about the example of Ethiopia with, with uh, heat tolerant wheat, which again allows farmers to, to gain much greater yields with yeet over, wheat over a short period of time. Um, but also produce wheat in areas where they weren't able to produce it before because it was either too hot, the land too marginal, et cetera. And so within just a few short years really helped Ethiopia gain self-sufficiency in wheat. Now, I think that this is you know, an example that I think that we can scale up quickly, again, working with our partners um, across the African continent. Um, so again, um, this is something that you know, we welcome working with uh, the farm initiative to increase productivity with EFAD in that vein, working with programs of USAID on the ground. Um, importantly, um, um, importantly, the Global Alliance for Food Security to really help us bring together, again, these multi-sectoral, short, medium, and longer-term actions. Uh, but we think that you know, quickly, if we put the right focus, the right resources in with the technologies that we have on hand, we'll be able to scale up production very, very quickly in the short term to mitigate uh, this crisis. Thank you. Tremendous. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, one of the words I was wondering if you're going to use is to catalyze, because that word was hovering around this room. People were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catalyze, catalyze. And, and I think that's what you're talking about here, isn't it? And it's fantastic if you can lever uh, some of the mechanisms and tools and they just put rocket fuel behind these production Absolutely. mechanisms. Absolutely. Because as you yeah. say, uh, the potential is enormous. Uh, let's go finally, uh, not last but not least, and there she is, to uh, Satu Santala from IFAD, Associate Vice President, External Relations and Governance Department. Uh, here we are in IFAD. Um, it's good to be here. Um, but what about uh, the organization's role in the context of the various international crisis response initiatives? Uh, I'm just wondering how IFAD's objectives fit in with these, uh, you know, and um, how will it blend in with other similar programs with, within IFED and beyond? Because we've been saying time and again, we want alignment, we don't want conflict, we want pushing in the same direction. And if you're not in the right lane, step aside for somebody who's doing it better, let them do it and do something else that you do better. So can you talk to us about that, please? That sounded rather accusatory. I don't mean to accuse you. <laughs> <laughs> No, thanks. That's fine. And and thanks, Andrew. And, and so sorry not to be in the room myself. COVID came in the way, but, you know, this is the way, the life we live these days. It is, it is. Um, but yeah, just a, a few points. And thank you so much for, for all the, um, um, the interesting points that colleagues have made. Um, and it sparked a lot of thoughts in, in my head, too. Um, I think the first point I want to make is that I really welcome... Um, uh, the in, the attention and all the initiatives that have uh, been put in place in the past uh, few weeks and months, it really is important to have the political attention and and to create the momentum uh, to act. Um, so I think that's that's important to say. Um, and also, as I've been listening to uh, the, the colleagues also here, um, it's clear that also the, the width and breadth of, of issues that we have to be addressing is huge. Um, so it's important to see the big picture and to then for all of us to see where we fit in and where we can contribute going forward. Um, I'm, I had sort of three points about looking at these initiatives from the point of view of IFAD. Um, so three points I wanted to make. The first one was, was on that, well, actually, ultimately, it really is about action in the real world. Um, making sure that we do get support for activities that make a difference um, um, and that so that we're not accused of, of just creating more talk shops. Um, <clears throat> if you look at it from the point of view of IFAD, um, we were created uh, as a response to a food crisis in the 70s, um, precisely to build sustainable solutions. Um, so we already uh, are um, in this area, you know, 100% of our work is in the space of supporting diversified, inclusive uh, local production and value chains. Um, and we know from our um, evidence and experience the importance to invest in both 
protecting rural livelihoods and building the resilience of small scale agriculture and rural communities. Um, and through that, promoting uh, food security, improving nutrition, eliminating hunger and poverty. So really, um, that's we already know this is what has to be done. And, and Beth also spoke about this, like <clears throat> continuing to deliver on this uh, is, is what, what matters to us. And of course, uh, at the same time, um, contributing to shaping both globally and regionally policies that are pro-poor and that can contribute to better livelihoods uh, in the rural sector. So not only to focus on finding the biggest uh, uh, solutions um, that look great, but also remembering who we're serving and, uh, and the, the impact on the, the poor and the rural people. <clears throat> so for Ifad, um, the question currently is really not at all about shifting our emphasis or our resources, but it is really critically about our ability to continue delivering um, our work, our current work program um, with our core resources that we have for the next three years um, of about 3.5 billion, leveraging them up to 11 billion um, or mobilizing um, with them uh, about 11 billion um, is really what we're doing. But of course, we know it's not enough. We're looking, how can we scale up? In the short term, um, uh, how, um, how we're able to include more short-term measures into our programs, especially in countries that are most impacted. But of course, um, the, for us, the important piece is the medium term. How can we scale up to fill uh, the investment gap? Um, um, we very much welcome in this space the, the emphasis of all of the initiatives so not creating new institutions or channels. Uh, however, of course, we will uh, appreciate a strong support for, from these initiatives to ensure that there is adequate resourcing for the existing ones. If it is owned by our member states um, and many important ones around this table as well, um, and we'll be engaging in our next replenishment negotiations starting in a few months. Um, and that will be the time to reflect expectations and hopefully also build the political will to scale up our work. Um, and for us, um, ideally, the global attention and, and the coordination efforts will contribute to our replenishment discussions and results, um, and, um, and hopefully uh, to make sure that global attention will not have moved on to another topic um, by uh, next year when we do this replenishment. So my, so my first point was really on getting uh, action on the ground, getting resources to where they're needed. Uh, my second point is on um, that is it remains really important uh, that we connect these global crisis initiatives to country demands and needs so that we're not speaking in the abstract, but really connecting to the country realities um, and uh, that we're able to um, to um, these, these, that these various uh, information exchanges and coordination efforts really facilitate coherent and effective action at the country level. Um, and we of course do so ourselves by connecting whatever we contribute in the global arena to, to our um, work on the ground. And, um, and I think it's also really important to remember um, to, to include the voices of the countries and communities impacted um, in these global conversations. And my third point is really on convergence of these initiatives. And I think it's, it's a really good progress uh, in a you know, few weeks time that we've seen the emergence of, of various initiatives and, and I'm hearing much more of a coherent message and, and I think um, a little bit of a structuring of, of how these different in, uh, in, uh, initiatives work together. Um, but super important that we do not duplicate efforts and we don't fragment attention and, and uh, asks too much. Um, IFAD has been very actively engaging in, in all of these initiatives. Um, and as Celine earlier mentioned, we've worked closely with France to develop ideas for the Farm Pillar 3 um, and very happy to see common themes across these initiatives. Um, and we're, of course, very much looking forward to with, with partners to, to work within GAFs also to build further this convergence between, between especially between farm and, um, and GAFs. Um, and of course, at the investments level or, or at the realities level, uh, coordination uh, 
naturally continues to be important. Uh, we at IFAD have a very clear uh, role to play in the global architecture and a very clear focus. Uh, um, and then others fill uh, other key roles. Um, and I think the, the uh, initiatives that also here today we're discussing can really bring value by ensuring that there is attention to investments in various important areas and, and aspects that, that they are all happening. So humanitarian and the longer term, maybe larger um, investments in infra uh, ver versus smaller and, and more rural and so on. And also they, they can add value by really insisting on, on coordination to happen. Um, and of course, the most important coordination always happens at the country level. Coordination so these are the at the country of level. Satya, I'm going to dive in. You breathed there and I thought, she breathed. Let me dive in. That's what I do in radio as well. I'm going to stop you in your tracks because you've given a lot, lot to think about. And I see from the chat box, you see the little bubble there at the bottom, a few questions and comments and thoughts are coming in. And if we have time before 2.45, then we'll try and uh, get you to field some of those questions. Um, but we have um, Gabriel Ferrero, the CFS chair, who is ready and Ambassador, I know that you are going to answer this particular question because we want to know what the role of the uh, Committee on World Food Security uh, is. And you're the Ambassador at Large for Global Food Security of Spain, of course. So what is the CFS's role specifically looking at uh, the UN Crisis Response Group? Thank you very much, uh, Henry, and good uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry for not being able to be physically uh, in IFAD, it's a shame being in Rome, but it couldn't make it. So well, before addressing this uh, concrete uh, question, allow me to say, uh, Henry, that uh, this high-level session of the annual assembly of the Global Donald Platform, uh, I feel that indeed is very focused on, on its questions and it raises very important question issues uh, and the title Building Consensus and Coordination is a very good reflect of this, of this fact. So now on, on your question, well, uh, well first, uh, just to make it clear, the CFS is an, as a committee, it's an intergovernmental committee composed by close to 100 member states, together with the, almost the whole of the UN United Nations system, not just the Rome based agencies, and with uh, very strong mechanisms that cover the different constituencies and interests involved. So as such, the committee uh, well, first, it's not uh, promoting any initiative uh, or a specific initiative, and uh, rather what the Committee on World Food Security, uh, in looking at its nature as an intergovernmental and inclusive committee, and also looking at the mandate that member states agreed to, uh, to put on this uh, committee, what it's doing now is actually trying to serve as the platform in which uh, all the different proposals, and this include all the initiatives that we are uh, discussing today and we, are, we have been seeing uh, emer emerging during the last few months uh, as the result of different leaderships that are, are being mobilized, is serving as the platform in where all these initiatives may come together and uh, uh, being loyal to the mandate that was given to the committee as an intergovernmental committee, which is precisely fostering global uh, policy coordination for food security and nutrition, and also policy convergence on the second term. Uh, this means also trying to build consensus on the concrete uh, ways forward to achieve food security and nutrition, and third, in support of country-led processes. So this is, I'm just outlining the mandate uh, that was given by member states to the committee after the reform uh, of uh, the CFS, uh, 12 years ago, precisely in the wake of the uh, last food system, global food system uh, crisis. So this is what the committee uh, is uh, and needs and is mandated to offer. Uh, so in this uh, sense, our first or my first priority is indeed uh, do all in the hands of the committee to be working together with the whole of the United Nations system uh, on the analysis and on the uh, ident or on identifying which would be the appropriate responses on the different dimensions. This, this is uh, let's say the entry point on the way we, I am connecting, uh, leading the Committee on World Food Security uh, with the Global Crisis Response Group of the Secretary General. Uh, 
uh, as the Intergovernmental Committee that the CFS represents, uh, we are, I am connected at the technical level to the Secretariat, at the uh, making use of the mechanisms uh, of the Committee on the World Food Security, Civil Society, the private sector mechanism, and the science policy interface of the committee, the high level panel of experts, making it available to the Secretary General's efforts to provide this uh, collective analysis and uh, roadmap for facing this, this crisis. And of course, uh, bridging uh, through my leadership with the uh, UN uh, leadership as well, and making sure that all what we do is well connected. And in this way, we serve as a platform in which the country's leadership, and this includes, of course, the different initiatives that we see today, may come uh, together, may share their different perspectives, and we may, in a very difficult context for multilateral action, build collectively uh, as a, a shared sense of the ways we should be proceeding or we should be taking. So this is what we, uh, we are doing, uh, Henry. And uh, I hope that uh, striving to contribute to this uh, better coordination, our uh, building consensus or convergence, as Satu was already saying, we can uh, play the role we are expected. So this is why I'm delighted that we will be doing this in a very concrete way, uh, convening a high level uh, meeting together with the president of the General Assembly and with the Global Crisis Response Group through the Secretary General in July on the 18th as a way uh, to bring all the different initiatives together, listen first to countries and those, especially those who are being most affected, and then trying to distill uh, the key uh, policy areas which are starting to be uh, are starting to emerge, sorry, from the different initiatives that are being uh, that are being proposed. The, David Navarro spoke very clearly about five elements: humanitarian action, trade, productivity, especially on smallholder and family farmers, social protection, and more financing and fiscal spaces needed. So this, this could be very easily be five elements to to build uh, upon at this uh, high level meeting, and hopefully link uh, to a more not just coordination but convergence, as Satu was saying. My final remark, uh, Henry. Uh, speaks also to what Satu Santala was saying about uh, aligning uh, or supporting countries' uh, efforts in the appropriate way. Uh, I was, uh, while she was speaking, I was going back and reading the Rome principles that were agreed uh, in 2009 at the World Summit on Food Security in Rome to respond to the previous crisis. And uh, I recommend everyone to go back to those principles that speak first uh, to the ways in which the international community and very especially the global donor community should support countries and in which ways and uh, under which principles. I strongly believe that these five principles are still very 100% uh, valid and that would be an excellent guide to start and to agree upon also in the ways in which we should align with country-led efforts. We should harmonize our support and make sure that all what we do at the country level, very especially, is fully, fully coordinated and fully aligned towards the country-led uh, proposals and strategies. So that's a very good piece of advice with which to, to close uh, your initial remarks, Ambassador Ferrero. Thank you very much. So go back to the Rome principles, 2009. They're there. You can just Google them, remind yourself of them, study them, because that will be your guide. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I do have um, uh, some supplementary questions, but I, I've, I've tried as much as possible to give precedence to those people who are either tuning in online with questions in the chat box or here live in uh, this room. And um, a message has come in from Kip Rono, that's a good Kenyan name, um, asking about international treaties and uh, you know, to promote food security for few countries faithful enough to implement them. For example, the Map Maputo Declaration of 2003 and the CADAP aim to increase uh, annual national budgetary allocations for agriculture to at least 10% and ensure a growth of the agricultural output of at least 6% annually. So the question, I'm gonna start off with you, yeah. Beth, I have to go to you first of all. Do we have, says Kip, do we have an implementation framework and or supervisory plan 
to ensure that these countries that sign up to these things are actually going to implement them? Well, great. Well, um, thanks a lot. That's a really important question about what African governments are putting themselves into agricultural food security, into this crisis in particular. And I wanna go back to the May 19th meeting that the African Union co-hosted with the president of the African Development Bank that brought together ministers of agriculture and ministers of finance from across Africa to discuss this crisis and discuss what, they, uh, what actions to take forward. And overwhelmingly, they called for the standing up of the African Emergency Food Production Facility uh, that we have stood up at the African Development Bank. And just to show the demand and the willingness of governments to put money in into this effort right now, it is it is nearly fully subscribed mm -hmm. already uh, from countries requesting uh, money to borrow, to put into their national budgets in order to really deliver, to increase production and productivity right now mm -hmm. to mitigate this crisis. And I think that the African Development Bank, we've mobilized $1.3 billion of our own resources to lend to governments to do this uh, with our technical support again. Uh, but we're still looking for $200 million uh, to really bridge that gap, to really make up the $1.5 billion facility. Again, this is showing you know, leadership, commitment, and action on the part of African governments that I think we as a global community uh, need to support. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just wondering if uh, any of our other colleagues uh, joining us online would like to uh, supplement what Beth has just said. Um, it could be uh, about the uh, African communities or countries, uh, as Kip was asking, or there are parallel ways in which it could be answered looking beyond uh, Africa. Y yes, Jim, Jim Barnard from USAID. Just to, 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 to answer Kip's question, um, that we certainly have within the within USAID and the Feed the Future program have been partnering very closely with um, African Union and, and African partners uh, around the continent uh, over the years uh, on doing a, on creating a mechanism that looks together and as partners on the investments that are going to to meet the the CADAP and the Mabkutu Declaration um, goals. Those are goals that are that are very um, ambitious, um, but are ones that are, we all are committed to. And so there isn't a mechanism by which we do that on a, a regular basis. And so. Um, that keeps your best assured that there's a system in place and we are tracking that in the, the long term. Back to you. Jim, thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to go to another question. This is from Thierry Giordano, who says, who, who welcomes the contributions, but says, uh, however, however, much of, or most of these initiatives do not generate much traction and are struggling to get support and put in brackets, farm initiative. Could we say that one of the reasons for this lack of traction is that it's hard to see how these initiatives would support any of the transformations needed for food systems to become resilient and sustainable? And or is it because the drivers of food system transformation are for most, well, mostly outside the food system, meaning that we're trapped in a sectoral approach that is leading nowhere? That's provocative from Thierry Giordano. Who would like to answer that? I'm looking at David Nabarro. Thank you. I was uh, delighted that uh, you came to me because uh, as far as we are concerned in the Global Crisis Response Group, we have to look at these issues as cross-sectoral issues. Of course, there's massive disturbances in food and agriculture systems. There's massive disturbances in energy systems, there's terrible problems in financing systems, particularly after the huge costs of COVID. But you can't deal with any of these systems disturbances in isolation. They've all got to be dealt with together because poor people, the 1.7 billion who are really feeling the result of all this, they're not saying we're going to go to the food people for this or the finance people for that or the energy people for that. They have to cope with the fact that their lives are being turned upside down. And there's only one way to deal with this, Henry, and all of us, and that is to put aside our institutional uh, foci and our logos and stuff, to put aside our preconceptions and to realize this is the most massive crisis that we've been involved in ever in our professional careers. And we've got to do it completely differently. And at the moment, we're all like standing on the edge of the river. 
testing the water. Does it feel right? Can we go in? Is it the right kind of current and so on? No, get in, but together, hooked up together, hooked up together and not breaking because that's the only way. Now, too much of this, our initiative, this initiative, this initiative, not creating anything new. No, no, no. We've got to create something new, which is working together in unison like never before. And that means the strongest social protection to protect these smallholders. Otherwise, they're all going to go into the towns. They're all going to be looking for possible employment. They're going to be really fed up and they're going to not be happy. And governments are going to be paralyzed like Sri Lanka. But we will get lots of them. Bang, bang, bang in the next few months. And everybody knows that if you've got political perturbation, it's much harder to actually help people out. So let's stop the politics going wrong. Let's work together because this is huge. And this group is the only group in the world that has the potential to really work together. David, thank you very much indeed. Who on earth wants to follow that? I'm looking. Satu is smiling. Ambassador Gabriel is, is looking keenly at the camera. And now he's putting yeah. his hand. Okay, over to you. Yeah, I may. Just to emphasize, thank you, David, for such a powerful message which, with, which, with which I fully agree. And uh, two ideas from my side, two reactions. Well, uh, first, in response to, the, to your, your original question, Henry, and coming from Thierry, if I'm right, uh, what well, is a very important not to separate what we are witnessing now and the responses we need to provide now from the food systems transformation that is also driven by the club, by climate change uh, concerns or biodiversity conservation and other issues. So it's not a separate issue. We need to keep the long-term vision we had nine months ago about the need to transform food systems to be more sustainable, more inclusive, and more resilient. This is the long-term response that we need to give now. So it's not a separate agenda. So we need to bring to this response, uh, and I'm talking a response, uh, a shared response, not in several different initiatives, this perspective. And second, uh, David fully agree. I think we need to act, but now is the time to act together. And this is why the, uh, what we're going to be convening in June together with the President of the General Assembly and with the Secretary General will be under the motto of time to act together. And it is indeed time to go into the river and uh, uh, but mm. hand, taking our hands all together and at the same river and uh, bring all the elements that we all are starting to know that are key for facing this huge, this huge challenge. So thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Henry. Over to you. Ambassador Ferrero, thank you very much indeed. Okay, uh, Satu Santala, you want to contribute. Are you standing by the river? Are you dipping in your toe? Or are you holding the hand of uh, David Nabarro and Ambassador Ferrero and everybody Very else firmly time? holding their hands right in the middle of the river. Um, okay. And I think, uh, no, it's uh, very powerful from both of you and, and fully agree with this. This is really what has to happen and, and moving together, but also like moving together. I, I think you said, David, uh, into the end of this year, early next year. Yeah. I think this is we're in it for a little bit longer. Whole, I think like not giving up on this. There's been underinvestment uh, in rural development and agriculture in uh, quite a long time. I think we need to kind of set that that straight and kind of stay at it. Fully agree that this is far beyond um, what each one of us is doing individually. It's far beyond uh, agriculture as well. Um, and and I agree with you. Um, David, with your message about, you know, we really need to do something differently, something in a, a new way, but let that differently be precisely as you say, the fact about working together. Because also, it's not only about doing new things or different things, it's also about doing the things we know work, doing the things we already knew needed to be done. And uh, I forget who it was, who, oh, it was maybe it was Namkola who was saying about. Um, that you know, looking at the agroecological uh, solutions, looking at the 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 more environmentally friendly solutions, maybe looking at bio bio uh, 
uh, fertilizers, whatever it is. But I mean, we already knew what, you know, what we needed to do in order to make the food systems more sustainable. So it's also about just doing more and better of what we already were doing and needed and knew had to be done and that we know that works. Let's count on evidence. Satu, thank you very much indeed. A couple of questions quickly before we round up. And one is from Inga Brodal, who uh, would like the panelists to reflect on the potential impact the current WTO round may have on the ongoing food crisis and set the framework for reshaping food systems. So the WTO round and the potential impact it may have on the ongoing food crisis. Uh, David is ready, but I want to see if anybody else before David comes back in, who's keen. And I see Ambassador Jorgensen has changed. <laughs> right, okay. Would you, like to, uh, would you like to declare yourself, sir? Yes, of course. Um, I'm Sylvain Fournel. I'm the deputy to the ambassador. She had to go away, unfortunately. And uh, All right, yes. we'd like to offer her apologies. Um, but since I have the floor, if you'll allow me, on the previous yes. question, I'm not so sure that the initiatives we're talking about are not gaining traction. Actually, my my um, my assessment is that they are, and we have seen a mushrooming sequence now of initiatives. That has been the case for the farm initiative as early as the end of March, endorsement by all EU uh, heads of state and governments. It was followed by the call to action of the US, the Global Alliance for Food Security, and now they are converging. So I'm not really not sure they're not getting traction. I think they are, especially as they do articulate now uh, quite visibly. I would also like to, you know, to, to support very much for what, um, what the Associate Vice President Satu Santala said about the need to build on what is proven to work. That is very true. And I would also very much associate myself, uh, you know, with, um, with the importance of, of some institutional rendezvous that we have ahead of us, like the 13th replenishment of EFAD. Over the last two replenishment cycles, France, for instance, increased its contribution by 50% each time. I cannot promise what we'll do for next time, but definitely these are important moments ahead of us. And more broadly, I think if we are now to catalyze, this was the word in the previous debate, uh, to talk about the catalytic action, I, I think there are three main ways in which donors can do that. Of course, they must have concrete propositions in response to, to immediate expectations, but they also, you know, um, must, um, their engagement can also inspire the private sector. I think it's been overlooked so far in our discussion, whereas it's important. And, and finally, and as Satu was saying brilliantly, we have to seize the political momentum created, unfortunately, by this crisis to drive our long-term action in the right direction towards more resilience and more sustainability of the food system. So basically not doing necessarily something new, but to a much bigger scale. And with, uh, I think you said uh, yourself, uh, putting a rocket behind what we were doing that is proven to work. So yeah, yeah. so that, that would be my answer. Thanks. Deputy Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and anybody uh, keen to respond briefly because we're, running a little bit out of time now, um, on that question from Inga Brodal on the potential impact the current WTO round uh, may have on the ongoing food crisis. David, did you want to respond briefly to that? Just to say, everybody, I mean, in WTO, real efforts have been made to try to create a protocol so that when countries are going to put export bans in place, they give about three weeks notice. They explain why they're doing it because nobody wants to stop them doing it if they absolutely consider it's necessary for domestic purposes. Uh, and then they basically give those who are dependent on the goods that they're exporting an opportunity to find different markets. We know from 2008 that the sudden imposition of rice export bans uh, actually had a very rapid and and detrimental impact on the global situation with huge impact uh, on uh, nutrition and well-being. And it would be really desperate if we continue with export ban after export ban after export ban on wheat, on oils, on barley, and then, uh, got, I hope not, but on rice. So 
I hope that this part is going to work. It's awfully difficult, terrible negotiations. It really matters. The second part, which is on enabling goods that are destined for humanitarian action to be able to escape these export bans, that's also hugely important. WFP, with the increasing caseload, is going to face all sorts of problems. And so we are super hopeful. In our food working group uh, of the GCRG yesterday, we heard from people at WTO. They've got their fingers crossed, but it's not 100% certain. I think everybody knows this is super tricky stuff. Thank you, Henry. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, David. Okay, uh, closing question for our session here. Um, what, what can donors do concretely now? We've had a lot of goodwill in the room here. A lot of people talking about alignment and um, wading into the water together, which, which is great. But um, what can we do concretely now and how can we coordinate properly and meaningfully uh, from, from now on? Uh, Sebastian, I've not heard from you for a while. What do you think? Uh, thanks, Henry. Uh, happy to come back in. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we get two things right. The one thing is the immediate crisis response. We must put funding now to the appropriate organizations so that they can reach those most affected. And then secondly, we must show that we do the right thing in the long term, that we set the right path for the long term as well by doing that, because we need to stick to that long term transformation of the agricultural food system. As Ambassador Ferrero said earlier, we have that. We had that nine months ago, and we cannot lose that over the crisis. Quite the contrary, what we need to do is we need to use that crisis, for lack of a better word, to push that agenda forward even quicker. And if we get those two things right, so immediate funding, and there need to be large numbers. Germany has tried to go ahead there. We hope others, others will follow. We have the G7 summit coming up uh, as the next uh, point in time there. And also ensuring that what we do now doesn't counteract, but supports that long-term transformation. I think that's the way to go. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Jim, over, over to you. I mean, what donors can do concretely now and properly coordinate from now on, because that's why we're here. We want to make sure that happens. Yeah, and let me just um, table thump what Sebastian just said, and totally agree completely with with, with his with his approach. That's on my table points. thump. Okay, that's good. And and um and say that Henry, the other piece of this is that the actions in the field in our in our partner countries around the world that are suffering, as as David again so eloquently has described to this audience. And so to the extent that we can ensure that kind of coordination is happening at the local level in these communities across the board, hitting these key sectors, I think then, then we will be acting in a way that rises to the level of the challenge before us. Pass back to you. Tremendous uh, closing thoughts. Beth, your closing thought, thought on this, real coordination from now on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think coordination is key. I mean, these global forums are incredible. Um, coordination at the country level, I think, is where the rubber is going to meet the road. And so we need to make sure that we're really making sure that happens through everything that we do. And just to say that, you know, we've been through a food price crisis before 14 years ago. This one is so much worse uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, COVID, climate, uh, the severity of everything that's going on in the world. Uh, but again, like people have been saying, we, we know what to do. The technologies that African farmers need uh, exist, and we have to get them out and really focus on that at scale. Again, there are longer term issues that we need to do to fix the food system. But right now, to get those technologies to farmers in the next few seasons will be game changing. So we will have to rely less on safety nets, less on emergency systems, and let African farmers feed themselves. Thank you very much indeed, Beth. I'm tempted to close this session now. I'm just looking closely at the faces of our colleagues online to see if any of their muscles are twitching in anticipation of saying anything further that will send us away with energy, enthusiasm, determined to coordinate, to align, to work together. Speak now if I ever hold your peace. Satu, in, min, in minutiae. Yes. Exactly. No, I just want to say that the, the three above speakers have just said it so beautifully that I just yes. want to applaud to that and say ah, thank you so much and fully like subscribe that. to that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Satu, David, Sebastian, Celine, Gabriel, Beth, and uh, Jim, and the Deputy Ambassador. Thank you very much indeed. That closes this high-level uh, session, um, which we try to synthesize uh, things. And uh, let's try and synthesize. Finally now, uh, you can stay on the line 
colleagues, if you want to see this final part, because we're actually going to close the agar uh, in this way. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jim Woodhill to uh, speak. Where is Jim? Yes, there we are. Um, because we've got to try and work out where we got to over the last uh, a couple of days. You, you, you can come forward, uh, Jim, if you uh, choose. Um, because this was quite some time in the conceiving, and now we've birthed it, this particular uh, session, this particular aga, and this focus on food systems transformations at time of crisis, better coordination. And we're going to hear from you, and then, of course, our co-chair of the GTP PRD, Conrad Ryan, and then Bruce Campbell is uh, from the Swiss Development Corporation Agency, um, and then you will round us off. So, um, Jim, over to you, yeah. Thank you, Henry, and uh, thanks to our previous panel that I think has been super enlightening about where things are going and, again, underscored the critical need for, for coordination. Let me say something about context, um, four key points, and then a little bit of what the donor platform is imagining we might follow up with from yeah. this, this event. Um, I mean, of course, the Food Systems Summit, which I think has really put a whole new framing um, about food systems on the agenda. But then, of course, the whole crisis we've just heard about and the critical need to coordinate not only about the short-term crisis, but also about how you keep the long-term big transitions that are needed moving forward. And a third point there about context, I think it's easy to get a little bit uh, sometimes overwhelmed by the struggles we're dealing with. But I think what we've also seen um, over these last few days, and I think all of us working in this space, how many amazing initiatives and amazing people are yeah. working so hard in so many different ways. And I think we heard that in what we got some insights into in the follow-up on the National Pathways yeah. yesterday. So I think, you know, again, how do we, how do we sort of uh, acknowledge that incredible positive energy of so many people working and make sure that, you know, donors and others can really support that uh, work often, which is happening, you know, unrecognised at a very local level and through to the global level. Four points. I mean, first thing, I've already just hinted a bit. I think we need to take really seriously the whole reframing that a food systems approach has brought. I think it's it, it really is linking climate issues, poverty issues, health issues into the wider economy. And that does actually call for some fundamental different thinking at both national and global levels. And I think brings a whole new challenge, but a whole new exciting domain in, in which we're, we're working. The second point, I think there's been no doubt left over the last couple of days about how fundamentally important these national pathways are as a way of moving forward. And I think we perhaps said it yesterday, but again, seeing these pathways not as something that's on paper, but as actually literally a pathway that everybody is walking together over the coming years, constantly learning and thinking and updating as countries move forward with tackling these enormous challenges and really seeing these pathways as a, as a fundamental mechanism for supporting coordination at the, at the national level. And so again, there, how can donors really get behind those pathways and really look at what is, is fundamentally needed at a national level uh, to support progress there. And we've heard a lot of ideas over the last couple of days about what could be there. We've got a whole list of potential leverage points yeah. that came out of the small group discussions yesterday. And then my fourth point there is, is I guess, around the structural changes. And I think it, you know, it's very easy to get caught up with short-term interventions, but I think we've heard a lot over the last year about the really big structural changes that we have to get our heads around. And so how can donor support, on one hand, about the short-term deliverables and getting concrete changes made on the ground, but how can they also coordinate in bringing about the big policy changes that are needed, uh, the, the deeper thinking at a national level to deal with uh, the fundamental causes of the sort of problems we're seeing mm -hmm. today? And I think that requires investment at both those levels as well. And I think we've seen from some of the Cirrus report, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of small little projects don't always add up to no. the big changes we need. So how do we think about putting the umbrella over all of those really good efforts that can help to support that structural change? What the global donor platform is looking at doing over the next uh, year, I guess, and, and perhaps a bit shorter time frame than that, is really trying to draw some lessons about country level coordination. So there's been a lot of efforts in the past. We're looking at a program that will draw some of those lessons together, look at some of the very specific needs that have come out of the last couple of days, take that a little bit further, and then try and reflect that back to donors about saying, look, here's some practical good principles 
um, good practices that we would expect to see happening at a national level to get that coordination happening uh, better at a country level, acknowledging that's already you know, a fair amount of stuff happening. And I think also underscoring the point that's come out over and over again over the last couple of days, it's not just about donor coordination, it's coordination across a whole range of different players. And in that sense, the, the sort of dialogues and the bringing multiple different players to the table that these national pathways have started to do is also fundamentally important. And so for donors, actually supporting the process behind that is also very important. Uh -huh. Jim, thank you very much. I feel like giving you a round of applause. Very well summed up. <laughs> Jim Woodhill, to advise to the GDPRD. Uh, let's uh, hear from the co-chair, Conrad Ryan. Uh, Conrad, you've been, uh, I can see you've been, you've been focusing and you've been collecting your thoughts. And how are you going to send us forward, Conrad, as co-chair of the GDPRD? Thanks a lot, Henry, and many thanks, Jim. Very academic and uh, for summarizing everything. I believe we had a very productive, stimulating, very interactive uh, assembly. Yeah. And uh, discussions, I believe, have been quite open, straightforward, yeah. putting the, the finger on the wound, on the wounds. I mean, we know what should be done. Mm -hmm. And now is really, I guess, the time for action. And the challenges are daunting. So I trust that the platform will stay engaged and uh, we will do what we can uh, to try to improve the situation, let's put it diplomatically. Mm -hmm. We will also, um, administratively speaking, uh, distribute the, the presentations. And that leaves me now to thank again the Secretariat for setting up this excellent assembly. For all speakers, you have been amazing, really fantastic presentations and uh, need a few days to digest all the, so. all the amazing projects and input that's, inputs that have been provided. And then last but not least, of course, all the, all the participants, whether you participated here physically or virtually, thank you very much for participating, for engaging in the chats, etc. And most importantly, my friend Henry, thank <laughs> my, you for stimulating. My point. Yes, yes. Uh, dank. Yes, it was really <laughs> great. And uh, we need this kind of energy that you represent. The Thanks energy so quella, as you yes. would say in Cheers. München. <laughs> thank yes. you very much indeed, Conrad, and the same to you, back to you. And finally, um, Bruce Campbell, who's with the Swiss Development Cooperation Agency. We, we only met yesterday, but we got on really, really well. And uh, you've got a few very... Uh, pithy closing thoughts for us. Well, when I got here yesterday morning, I, I saw Maurizio and he was, seemed, was obviously nervous about the, this event two years in, uh, into COVID and now here we are again. I was Whoa. worried how it worked out. And I said, just getting us here in person is already a success. And in fact, what we've seen, we've gone from strength to strength through that. We've uh, you know, partly gone through the national pathways. We've, we've looked at responsible land-based uh, uh, um, investment, youth entrepreneurship, and I think also through your moderation, but also through the executive, uh, the excellent documents uh, that uh, yeah. Maurizio and his team have prepared. Uh, we've been able to string this together, and so I think this is a great starting point. Um, I was also asked to just give a few uh, key takeaways, maybe conclusions from my side. Yeah. Uh, I'll try and do that very briefly. I mean, we started off with the, the three three Cs: um, you know, co uh, cl climate change, conflict, and COVID. Quite recently, we were discussing the three Fs: uh, fuel, fertilizer, and finance. This morning, we had the three As. So I thought mm -hmm. it'd be appropriate, since the letter has been taken yet, to maybe propose the three some three Ds. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, since we're here, 3D is kind of fitting. Um, so anyway, the first D would be de-risking. Um, I think as Olawale uh, pointed out just a, a, just a, a session earlier, um, just traveling the, the African continent is difficult. We need to lower barriers, not just in travel, but in all sorts of areas, yeah. because people respond to incentives and risks are disincentives. And if we can remove risks from uh, how people can act uh, and develop and innovate, then we can leverage a lot from the money that we're putting in to de-risk. The second is uh, diversity. We've seen uh, quite recently structural uh, weaknesses, but often in the name of efficiency, putting our eggs on one basket. Um, and so 
basically, uh, resilience comes through diversity, things like supply, supply chain diversity, product diversity, career diversity, of course, there's also biodiversity, and by being able to mesh up uh, more paths um, at a national level, wherever, 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 we have more to fall back on when things go wrong. Um, and then the third and final D would be dialogue and discourse. I can put two Ds in the, in the third one. <laughs> um, Where we said the national level, this is, seems to be the locus which is really coming out strongly here based on the national pathways. This is should be where we're concentrating. But there's also the question of discourse, of the, the, the messages, uh, the kind of things we like to communicate, the policy design that we, we have is maybe slightly um, higher structure. We have all these, um, the various, various fora, the, 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 the UN Global Crisis Group, we have the UN uh, FSS uh, hub GAFs, which I think is just about to start a meeting. Um, we need to build uh, the common narrative and avoid frag fragmentation, we need to make sure that, as uh, David Navarro said fittingly just beforehand, that we get in the river together. Yeah. And I think that's where the next step is from here. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Brilliant, Bruce Campbell. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I would, oh, that was, yeah, you deserve that as well. And I just want to keep your hands together for Maurizio Navarro. Um, he's been coordinating all of this at the Secretariat, you know, alongside Jim and the team. I just want to name check them. We've got Michelle, we've got Lisa, Alessandro, Luca, uh, Sierra, all the team. They put so much effort and energy into this. And um, I've been talking to them and liaising and engaging with them be be behind the scenes over the past uh, few weeks. And uh, did I forget anybody? Uh, you. I forgot your name. Monique, sorry, sorry, Monique, Monique, Monique. Yes, I just, I, it's really, really important to recognize and acknowledge them, okay? okay? Fantastic, guys, great work. Thank you very much indeed. Until next time, arrivederci. <laughs>